All right, welcome everybody to the 2017 Library of Congress National Book Festival. You're watching PBS Book View Now, and I'm your host, Rich Folley. I'm going to be with you all day, but right now I have the pleasure of sitting with Elizabeth Strout, who's the author of a brand new set of stories called Anything is Possible. I should say they're stories, but they're more interconnected. It's almost like a novel. You're telling the right. story of a single town in Illinois, right. Amgash, Illinois. Right. Can you talk a little bit about the structure of the novel for us, yeah, please? Yeah, you know, the structure just came to me naturally. It's just, I think, the way my mind works. Like, I saw this constellation of characters, and I sort of intuitively understood how they all overlapped. And so I would write pieces of it, you know, at different times and watch it come together. Yeah, and this isn't the first time you've use this type of structure no. for a lot of people who love Olive Kittredge right. you know you're writing about that rural main town now yeah. you've moved to the Midwest yep. some of us Midwesters <laughs> love, love to have you there now but you also have revisited the town that you started with uh, uh, My Name is Lucy Barton a novel right. that everybody knows which is a really character driven novel but now you've gone back to pick up the stories of all the characters yeah. and tell us bits about right. those people that we didn't get to see in Lucy Barton right you know when I was writing My Name is Lucy Barton I began to write Anything is Possible because I was, as I listened or wrote the, the pieces of um, conversation between her mother and Lucy in the hospital, I would, I would wonder about these people. And I'd think, well, what happened to those pretty nicely girls? Yeah. Or what happened to Mississippi Mary? Because I'm curious, you know, I'm just always curious. So I would just write different sketches. And by the time I was done, I realized, oh, this is interesting. This is like the completion. <laughs> Did you know you were going to go back and revisit some of these characters and pick up some of their storylines for us? Yeah, I did. I, I, I mean, I began to understand that yeah. as, as I was, yeah, right. S so l the idea for us too as readers is what gets left on the side of the road as you're developing right. these character sketches. These, you go so deep. We only see the tip of the iceberg yeah. oftentimes in yeah. your stories, but underneath you've written these incredible, at least in your mind, yeah. these incredible backstories for these people. Right, yeah. right. So, you know, I do, I do personally have a deep understanding of the people that I'm writing about. If I don't, then, I, then they don't make it. They get, off, they get tossed off the table. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, but if I can really feel like, okay, I know them, I can get in there, then I can go ahead and present it to you, the reader. Yeah. No, you've always, uh, people always think of you as this main writer, and I know sometimes you... Um, bristle at the suggestion of a sort of limited regionality. You've moved your story here to Illinois. Why Illinois? Why the yeah. Midwest and the rural elements of that? Because there's know, so many similarities. Well, there are, for one thing. So that was um, not a huge leap as much as it seemed to be. But when I was writing My Name is Lucy Barton, it came to me really early on as I was just starting to figure out her voice. All of a sudden I thought, oh, she comes from Skye. And I had been spending some time in the Midwest, and so I realized, no, 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 this is a, this is a young girl who grew up with sky around her, and I could see this little tiny house and all the sky, and so off I went. I, you know, and my husband and I went back to the Midwest a number of times to make sure that I had all the details right. So did you, you, know. did you live in the Midwest ever? And how did I you never have lived in the Midwest, yeah. but, um, but I, you know, I have a f my closest friend from New York came from the Midwest, and I've heard... And, you know, for many, many years, her stories about it. And then, as I said, we've spent time there, so. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, uh, one of the ways that people often describe your writing is spare. Yet I read this article recently about your brother who talked about the fact that you're sort of not a typical Yankee and that yeah. you are yeah. not the sort of reserved crowd person, that you yeah. are the storyteller of the family. And so how do you sort of, how did you yeah. go from that person who was drawn to story and about talking and you were... You went on stage at one point oh. and were a stand-up comedian <laughs> to sort of break through yeah. that mold. Horrifying. <laughs> to this person who is so quietly can tell a story in your books. Well, I think, I think the way I, I taught myself to write this way, you know, so I, I mean, I, I've always been a blabby person. I always, you know, was a little bit of an anomaly in Maine because I just talked all the time. Um, and so I learned as I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote, I learned how to use the spare clean sentence for my purposes. Right. Yeah. Because I've met m someone like Marilyn Robinson, who I think there's some similarities right. in your writing yeah. style. And she presents herself to me in the way that she writes. Um, you have been described yeah. otherwise. Yeah. So let's go back to that <laughs> stand-up comedy thing. Like, what was it for you back in the day when you decided right. you needed to break out of something? Right. You went up on stage and started telling your story right. that way. It's absolutely horrifying. Very terrifying. Um, I, I just couldn't figure out why my writing wasn't working. I'd been working at it, 
you know, really, really hard for many, many years. And there was just something that wasn't working. And I understood that, but I didn't know what it was. So I thought if I, I was always interested in comedy and because I, I think people laugh at something that's true. So I thought, what would happen if I put myself into that pressure cooker, you know, of being responsible for people That's laughing brave. immediately? Oh my God, it was so brave. <laughs> Thank you. It was very brave yeah. because That's it scary. was so scary. Yeah. So I took a class at the new school and every week somebody else would drop out because we were, it was terrifying. And then those of us who remained had to perform for our final exam at the comic strip in New York City. And I did. But the point is, the point is that during the writing of my routine, during the course of the semester and finding my voice um, for the routine, I realized I was making fun of myself as a white woman from New England. And I hadn't really realized that that's who I was until then. So was it a self-deprecating thing? The, very the much. Of oh, the white women very, from... Oh, yeah. please. So self-deprecating. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I understood as a result that to come from New England and to be a white woman is different than if you come from Louisiana or if you're Jewish and you come from Detroit, you know, whatever. These are differences that matter. Right. But there's a universality to it that, yes. that you mine in all of your books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I hope so. Right. Yeah. But that so was you came to writing. I mean, we at least discovered you later in life. You, yeah. you were not somebody who, you know, burst onto the scene in your early 20s. No. You might have been writing, but we didn't I know about writing, you then. Right. When did you decide to cross over that you were going to be a writer, and where did that love of story come from in you? I always wanted to be a writer. I have no memory of myself not being a writer. Like, I understood from a very, very young age that I was a writer. So um, what surprised me was how long it took for other people to <laughs> realize that, you know. I mean, I understood why they didn't, because my work wasn't good enough yet. But I just kept working and working and working and working. And... Um, and then it finally began to show up on the page. It sure did. I mean, uh, all of the, the people who love your books now, they've been adapted on television, the amazing HBO adaptation of Olive Kittredge. What's it like to see that work come across in yeah. another medium? It's very strange. It's very, I mean, it, it was great. I thought they did a wonderful job. But it was odd, you know, because when you're watching it, you think, okay, this is interesting. And then every so often I would think, oh, I wrote that sort of but I didn't write you right. know, the screenplay but it so was so you're watching it, it like, like we are to some yeah. degree yeah. yeah that's pretty wild it was very wild because right. a lot of the writers that we're talking to today have had their work adapted and it's amazing I would think to see your baby being turned into something yeah. that's not exactly your baby yeah um, exactly it's something not. else it's and, that, not. and that's where it's the interpretation else. of all art sort of takes out yeah. a new, a new exactly. look exactly exactly uh, well I want to remind our viewers that we're on Facebook right now and if you have questions we have a few more minutes with Miss Stroud and we'd love to hear your questions um, right now they're coming in and people from um uh, Bradley Harper, who just says, my biggest regret since I began writing is I don't read as much. Um, well, other people's words. I read and reread my stuff over and over and over, he says. So are you a huge reader yourself? Yes, I, I, I really believe for myself, I had to read everything that I could possibly read. The, you know, the good sentences. Mm -hmm. So I started with the classics and I kept repeating the classics. And I mean, I just read... In Constantly. a way where you're sort of dissecting it to see how they do it, or are you reading for pleasure, and does it affect your writing when you're reading someone else? I'm No, I don't think it does affect my writing. I mean, if I didn't read, I don't think I would be the writer that you know, I've been able to become. So I just, I just, at a very early age, would make lists of books, you know, starting with you know, War and Peace, literally, you know, and, and just read them and read through them, mm -hmm. and Magic Mountain, read through mm -hmm. them all, just read and read and read. And so... Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't dissecting how they did them, but, you know, the stories of William Trevor, I think they made their way into me because they're just so lovely. And, you know, I, you know, I reread re them so many times, yes. and Alice Munro's stories, that I think those two probably did affect my work in a good way. So uh, Alice Munro is a good example. So yeah. many of your stories, you sort of mind the, 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 the stories of seemingly unremarkable people, people going through their everyday yeah. lives, working... Right making it through me. but something you find a nugget in there and it turns it into something riveting for us as readers yeah. what is it that you're drawn to that sort of type of story that sort of right. hidden under the surface drama that exists in all of us because that because it does exist in all of us because every single person is their own universe you know we're all walking around and we have so much inside us and only bits and pieces get relayed to other people and that's so interesting to me that every single person just has so much stuff in them so the most ordinary people are what fascinate me mm -hmm. 
some some of your people sort of escape their their confines of their yeah. upbringing. Others can't ever leave it. Right. You've done both. I mean, yeah. you've, you know, you've, you've <laughs> left and come back <laughs> right. to Maine to right, some right. degree. Um, what are your thoughts about that sort of person who feels sort of trapped in their environment and not able to set sort of set out to the world that maybe they see out there but they can't get to? Right. You know, I think that I'm not sure that they feel trapped. I guess that's what I would say is that those of us that are looking back at them would say, oh, that poor trapped person. But I don't think that's necessarily the way they feel about their lives. Right. Often because it's how you they, might you frame know, it for us. Right. So maybe you're right. Maybe they don't feel that. Right. Because, I mean, if they really wanted to leave, they'd leave. And so I think their lives are their lives. And they have a dignity to them in their own setting. Yeah. When you were young, you knew you wanted to leave. I did. <laughs> and, you, and you did, and you ended up in New York, and you raised your family there yeah. for a while, and you went to law school at Syracuse yeah. for a while. Um, what was it that pushed you out of your confines? What was it when you were young that you just said, I, I need to go see more? You know, I don't know. I just, I think I was just born with that. I, it, it just seems to have been in my nature from a very early age. Mm -hmm. I was just always, you know, <laughs> looking around the corner. And, and how was your, uh, how was your time living in a, in a urban environment affected your return to a rural right. environment? What right. Is, how is that? Well, I think that, you know, I've lived in an urban environment for so long that it's, it's been, I think it's been really good for me because it separated me from the places that I've been writing about. And that distance has been very good for me. And there's always been a low level nostalgia bubbling away for, you know, the life that I left. And so in my stories, I can return to that. Yeah. And so New York seems a really lovely place to perch. Yeah. So you when know? you go back, do you feel like you still belong? Do you feel like there's still that's a world that you feel comfortable in? Or do you now feel like the outside observer now that you've sort of yeah. lived in a city environment for so long? You know, I, I think that I always feel like an outside observer wherever I live. I, I want to ask you a question from, sorry if I'm getting this wrong, Janyara Manzano, who just said, because you did enter writing late in your life, yeah. said, how did she find the strength to start showing other people yeah. your writing? When did you step out and say, it's time, I'm, I can do right. this? That's a very good question, and I, um, it was when I first moved to New York 34 years ago, I met a woman um, in a writing class at the New School, and that was one of the few writing classes I took that was helpful, otherwise I didn't find them particularly helpful, but that one was, and I met this woman, Kathy Chamberlain, and she became my reader, and she has still, be, she's still my main reader, she reads, you know, when I get when I get something done to a point where I don't know what to do with it anymore, I give it to Kathy. And she has been enormously helpful in my development as a writer. And so if you can find one person that you know they understand your sensibilities, then, then and they that can be would honest be good. with you. And, and they can be honest yeah. with you. And she just works. So that, you know, because you've got to be careful when you hand it to people because you're going to believe them and you shouldn't necessarily. Yes. So there's a lot of people who are saying they wish they could be here at this book festival. What, are, what do festivals like this mean to you where there's so many people all in one place celebrating the written yeah. word all in all under one roof? Right. It was exciting because we were walking through the door and there were all these little children in front of us. And I thought, isn't that wonderful? These parents have brought their kids to, you know, this book festival. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a great thing to see. Yeah, yeah, I love it too. Yeah. And I love sitting here with you and Thank being you. able to talk about your books. Thank you so much. And I never know what's going to come next, but I always know there's going to be some amazing exploration <laughs> of the human spirit. And thank I thank you. you for all you do. Thank you It's very really much. wonderful to have you here, Thanks folks. Thanks so much. All right, Elizabeth Stroud. Her new book is called Anything is Possible. And if you stay tuned, we have lots more coming here at PBS Book View Now. I'm your host, Rich Folley. We're at the Library of Congress National Book Festival 2017. So stick around.